So I will tell you what we do now. So now mine is the last presentation in this, what we call clinical trial parade. Okay, so maybe you will survive this. And after that, there's one more presentation by Giuseppe Rosano and he has to make up. And after that, we're done, okay? So uh, are we ready, gentlemen, in the back? Because then I will start the last presentation in, in this set. Um, so my topic is to talk about ACS and antithrombotic therapy and what's, what's coming up and what's, what's new. So to be brief on that, there were many trials investigating add-on antithrombotic therapy, aspirin replacement, and aspirin-free strategies in cardiovascular disease and event prevention. So this is like the scenario I'm, I'm talking about. So one thing is here is the called Gemini ACS trial which was looking into patients with ACS who are all on clopidogrel or ticagrelor to replace aspirin with rivaroxaban baby dose, 2.5 milligrams twice a day. So it was testing rivaroxaban 2.5 BID versus aspirin. And look at this, number one, they looked for significant bleeding, there was no significant difference. Number two, they looked for ischemic endpoints, no difference here. So now there's a big trial uh, the Gemini ACS trial planned, which will look into cardiovascular outcomes, uh, testing the hypothesis whether rivaroxaban is as good as aspirin or better in the setting uh, of ACS patients. That's a big trial. Okay, so here's the next. This is something called the Global Leader Study. So this was looking into patients with um, stable coronary disease or ACS in a stenting uh, scenario. And it was testing the hypothesis whether short-term aspirin plus long-term ticagrelor is better than standard treatment. And you, look, you can see it here. So aspirin was stopped in stable CID, uh, sorry, in both, both treatment arms after one month, but ticagrelor was continued for two years. And this was compared to standard therapy at that time, which is in stable CID, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel for one year, and an ACS uh, sorry, for, for um, yeah, it's stable CAD for one year and an ACS with ticagrelor uh, for one year. The results are out, and to make it quick, the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality and new Q-wave MI, and you can see it here in red. You can see that the significance level was not met, so therefore, it's quite simple. This strategy of ticagrelor together with aspirin for one month and ticagrelor for 23 months was not superior to standard treatment, so this trial didn't make its, meet its objectives. So another one with ticagrelor, this is now stable CAD, but high-risk patients, high-risk PCI. So here the question is asked whether um, ticagrelor plus aspirin for 12 months or reference strategy ticagrelor alone for 12 months after three months of dual antiplatelet therapy is better. So here we have three months of ticagrelor aspirin, and then after that, continued aspirin therapy or ticagrelor alone. We will see what that will, what that will show. Another one is ADAPT strategy in patients with increased bleeding risk. And this is all is looking for bleeding and um, ischemic endpoints. And this is the 12 designed 4,300 patients who um, have ACS or stable CAD, and they will receive one month of dual antiplatelet therapy. And after that one month, this is with a, with a modern uh, stand platform, will be randomized to single antiplatelet therapy for additional 11 months, or standard depth, which is considered aspirin for one year, and clopidogrel, for example, for five additional months. Okay, so it's looking for one month, dual antiplatelet versus six months of antiplatelet therapy in patients with high bleeding risk. Okay, another one. This is now in the diabetic patient. This is looking for aspirin, and you know that diabetics are not responding as well to aspirin as other patients. So this is looking in ACS patients whether a double dose aspirin is better than normal aspirin in these patients. Okay, so you can see it here. It's once a day aspirin, 100 milligrams, versus twice a day aspirin, 100 milligrams, in diabetics with ACS to see if more aspirin has a beneficial effect in ACS patients. This is not stable disease. Another one, 
looking in stable patients with coronary disease. It's the Themis trial. This is looking for Ticagalor versus placebo. So these patients, patients have stable CID, CAD, and they do have, the majority of them will have a low dose background of uh, aspirin treatment. And this is now looking in this patient population, which is considered high risk, if additional Ticagalor is superior to placebo treatment. So pretty much is looking for dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticagalor against single antiplatelet therapy with aspirin in patients with type 2 diabetes and stable CAD. And we know that there is a positive result. We know, though, we do not know um, uh, further details. So this will be presented soon. But obviously, the strategy seems to have some positive benefits. So we will, we are looking for this. This is interesting because, to remind you, aspirin treatment in patients with diabetes without CAD is not beneficial. You know this. So there's a little benefit in terms of event prevention, but on the other hand, more bleeding in this patient. So high-risk individuals without CAD with diabetes do not benefit from aspirin therapy because they have more bleeding events. Okay. So what is new? This is something completely new. This is um, tackling glycoprotein 6. So this glycoprotein is important for the interaction of platelets um, with, um, with atherosclerotic plaques. And the interesting thing here is that uh, the idea is that this drug called Rivacept may inhibit the interaction of platelets with the plaque, but will not have much impact uh, into systemic hemostasis. So potentially gives ischemic benefit, but not causes bleeding. So this is a very interesting thing. But you can see here ongoing phase, phase two trials. So this is kind of early in the development, but a very interesting concept. OK, so now topic for the triple therapy. So this is about patients with atrial fibrillation and uh, stent placement or acute coronary syndrome. So you know that we were thinking about triple therapy in these patients because you have to have, we were thinking of having uh, anticoagulation treatment with dual antiplatelet therapy. The drawback of this is a very high bleeding risk. So bleeding risk in this patient is almost four times as high as in patients not receiving triple therapy. So what are the strategies? So strategies were number one, short and triple therapy. That, that did work out. Use dual instead of triple therapy and use NOAC instead of VKA to reduce bleeding because of the safety profile. So last year we had these two trials, Pioneer HF and Redual PCI, and to make it short, the primary endpoint was bleeding. Uh, it was always um, um, major bleeding plus non-clinically relevant non-major bleeding. And you can see here that in both trials, these bleeding endpoints were significantly reduced in a treatment that was using dual antiplatelet, sorry, dual therapy with a NOAC and one antiplatelet agent. So in the case of Pioneer, it was Rivaroxaban 15 milligrams plus mostly Ticagrelor. And in Redual PCI, it was the Bigotron 110 BID or 150 BID together with mostly clopidogrel, but also some Ticagrelor patients. And in both trials, there were there was a febrile outcome with less significant bleeding. However, it needs to be mentioned that these trials were not powered for ischemic endpoints. These were powered for bleeding events. OK. Then there was this meta-analysis, taking these two trials together with older trials, like the WUST trial and the ISA triple. And they came up with this relative risk reduction 50% for all bleedings. So this is major and non, uh, major bleedings and non-major bleedings and minor bleedings. So, But the concept showed benefits in terms of bleeding risk without a uh, signal towards harm in terms of ischemic events. But again, keep in mind, not powered for ischemic events, powered for bleeding events. So these are the guideline recommendations, or let's say consensus papers. So these are, this is the North American's perspective. So the Americans said, OK, given these data, dual treatment, which means anticoagulation with one antiplatelet agent, so should be default strategy. And only in patients with high ischemic risk, it should be triple therapy. But on the other hand, these are the European guidelines, or the European consensus, completely the other way around. It should be triple therapy. And only in patients with very high bleeding risk, dual therapy should be considered. So same trials, very different perspective. And the reason why the Europeans went this way was because they said, well, well number one, we have a mix of patient populations 
with uh, CAD, stable CAD and ACS. And number two, trials were not powered for ischemic endpoints and we need more data. Okay, and this does make sense, although this is not statistically significant in the reduced PCI in the 110 BID dose where there were numerically more myocardial infarctions and more stent thrombosis, and that's why it was said, okay, maybe we have to think twice. So they were asking for new data, and this is another trial, the Augustus trial, which has a different design, the largest of, the, of these trials, 4,500 patients with stable CAD, or ACS and atrial fibrillation. And these patients were number one, randomized to receive a Pixaban 5 milligrams BID, so no dose reduction, or vitamin K antagonist. And then a two by two factorial design were randomized to receive aspirin or placebo. By this, investigating number one, NOAC versus vitamin K antagonist, and number two, looking for triple versus uh, dual therapy. It's a very smart trial. And results, were to be shown at the ACC 2019. You know, the ACC was just one week ago, one weekend, last weekend. And these are the results. This, this is taken from the New England Journal paper. So you can see in the upper graph that apixaban versus vitamin K versus warf warfarin, you can see there's a significant reduction, again, of major bleedings and uh, clinically relevant non-major bleedings. This was the primary endpoint. And on the other hand, if you look at the lower graph, if you look for aspirin versus placebo, a very significant high risk of bleeding in the aspirin group. Okay, two by two factorial design. The majority received clopidogrel and just some patients, uh, ticagrelor or prazogrel. Um, if you look at this, you can see very nicely in these upper graphs that leaving out aspirin has a big, big impact on bleeding risk, okay? So aspirin is one thing, but when you consider the, uh, the, uh, the graphs before, this trial is very nicely showing that NOAC versus warfarin shows benefits of NOAC treatment versus warfarin, and then in addition looks for aspirin effects on bleeding. Okay, the lower part is showing major bleedings, and in the Augustus trial, also major bleedings, which was a secondary endpoint, was significantly reduced in the apixaban arm versus um, the vitamin K arm. Okay, so this is now looking for death or ischemic events. This is the ischemic endpoint. Again, not powered, although bigger, not powered. And when you look at this, you do not see a numerical difference. Uh, difference. So hazard ratio is 0.93, so there's no difference. If you look at the lower part, I have to show it with my hands because I don't have a, oh, I do have a pointer here. Maybe I use this. <laughs> you can see here, so this is comparing apixaban with a vitamin K antagonist, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, and urgent revask. There's no difference. But when you look in the aspirin versus placebo arm, you can see here in the placebo non-aspirin arm, there are numerically higher numbers of MI stent thrombosis and urgent revascularization. So again, pointing out that some patients may benefit from triple therapy and not dual therapy. So I think it's a, it's a great trial. So there's more coming. Um, there's a trial from Munich, Approach ACS, which is also using a Pixaban, is dual therapy with uh, a Pixaban and Clopidogrel, and comparing with a classic triple therapy, vitamin K antagonist, aspirin, Clopidogrel, uh, with a shorter duration with, in patients with high uh, has blood score and a longer duration in patients with lower has blood score. So we are waiting for this. And the last one that's coming up is the Entrust AF PCI trial, which is using a Pixaban, uh, sorry, Edoxaban, 1,500 patients to be enrolled. Again, uh, comparing dual therapy with NOAC standard dose, 60 milligrams, Edoxaban plus a P2Y12 inhibitor with classic triple therapy vitamin K antagonist, P2Y12 inhibitor, and aspirin. And uh, it's estimated to be finished in June 2019. So this year, we will have these results as well. Okay, different topic. Uh, this is about reversal agents of NOAC. There are three principles. We, number one, have an antibody against a bigger trend, which is called erosizumab. We have a small bullet that fights kind of every antithrombotic agent. It's a small molecule. It's called seroparentac. And then there's a, a truncated factor 10A, um, which is tackling the 10A inhibitors, which is called uh, andexanet. So different con concepts. And to make it short, this is about the trials that we have right now. When you look at this, seroparentac is in phase two. So very early, we have to see if it works out. When you look at up. 
We have the full results of the phase three trial and idorosizumab was uh, approved by FDA and EMA. And in Dexanet, now the full cohort uh, st study cohort is published of the Annexa 4 trial, which is the phase three trial. Uh, there is FDA approval. EMA approval is pending, but the CHMP recommended conditional marketing authorization, so this will come. Okay, so this is the, what we have for the NOAC reversal agents. This is pretty much new, just published now. There is an antibody approach to inhibit ticagrelor uh, action. So in patients who have ticagrelor who bleed or need urgent surgery, there's now this antibody available. Well, it's not available. It's being studied to reverse the effect of uh, ticagrelor. So this is platelet aggregation. So basically, this is high platelet aggregation. If you give ticagrelor, you end up here. So you have low platelet aggregation. If you give placebo, you can see here platelet aggregation stays low. And if you give the antibody, platelet aggregation is normalized, meaning high platelet aggregation. So this is phase one, 64, phase one, health, healthy volunteers, but this is going into phase two now. And now this is my last topic. This is uh, the rationale for a factor 11 anti-inhibiting uh, drug. Why factor 11? Factor 11 uh, is interesting because it is involved in, in thrombus formation but not so much in hemostasis. So idea is if you inhibit this factor, you may have nice results in terms of clot prevention, in terms of uh, VTE prevention, but not as much bleeding events. So this is the rationale for this. So this is now showing that there was an uh, antisense oligonucleotide showing that if you use this, you have less patients with the VTE and at the same time have less bleedings than inoxaparin. And now, the antibody was developed to have the same effect, and this antibody against factor 10, against factor 11, is tested in the so called Foxtrot study, which is, I think, completed or almost completed the results. We'll, we will have the results pretty soon. So, this is testing um, apixaban, enoxaparin, or the new drug in patients uh, uh, to prevent uh, venous thromboembolism. So, this will be out very soon. Okay. Now, this is my last slide, a very important study. It is not the newest study, but it's important for you guys. So it's, it's looking for working hours and risk of divorce, okay? So this was a study in physicians, physicians, and there are striking differences in male and female physicians. So when you look at this, there's no whatsoever effects of working hours in female physicians on divorce rate. But if you look at the males, the longer working hours clearly associated with less risk of divorce, okay? So guys, if you work more, your risk of being divorced is lower. So if you don't follow that and you work long, uh, sorry, you, you do not work as long, work-life balance, you may be divorced. That is not good because this is the trial showing that this is investigating marital status and cardiovascular risk. So not being married, oh, this file is not normal, but anyway, you, you should see here, so if you're not married, your risk of cardiovascular death is higher. And it's even worse when you're divorced. If you're divorced, numerically, your risk is even higher to die from cardiovascular cause than just not being married, okay? So anyway, but if you survive and you're not married, you're divorced, there's one thing you can do. You should think of having a dog, okay? Because dog ownership is protective. So look at this. These are single households, so divorced physicians, okay? So if you have a dog in this setting, there's less cardiovascular events. And look at this. Cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality is significantly lower. Now, if you have a dog and you have your little chihuahua on your couch watching TV and you talk to your dog, this is not what you should do because you need a hunting dog, okay, guys? So you need a hunting dog. So when you look at scent dogs, pointing dogs, and hunting dog breeds, then your risk is low. So consider this when not working long hours during the week. So thank you very much.